to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel the of christ spreading the soul-saving message of and jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ joshua said as for me and my house we will serve the Lord. Welcome to our study of living messages of the Old Testament. We now enter into the period of the history of Israel. Joshua through history, is, Esther is kind of a history of Israel. This period covers about a thousand years in Israel's history and it spans three different types of governments. You've got Israel reigning as a theocracy where God is king operating as they should. Then they move to a monarchy where they desire to have a king. God gives it to them, but it doesn't work out like they thought it would. And eventually we find Israel in captivity under Babylon and later under Assyria. Joshua then covers about 50 years of the history of Israel under this period known as the theocracy where God is reigning as king. Key word to the book of Joshua is the word courage or courageous. God reminds His people that if you're going to enter Canaan land, if you're going to make it to that ultimate home that I've promised you, you must be courageous. There are going to be battles to fight. There are going to be difficulties to face. There may be even times when you feel like throwing in the towel, but you've got to remain courageous and never give up. Key verse, Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Notice what God says to Joshua. No man, God says, shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. God is making a plea to Joshua, be strong, don't give up. You're going to fill the void Moses left, but you be strong, I'll be with you, and God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. What's Joshua all about? Joshua fulfills, God fulfills, in the book of Joshua, God fulfills the promises that he makes. Friends, God will always keep his promises and Joshua is proof of that. Do you remember the promise in Genesis chapter 12 that God made to Abraham? I'll bless you. I'll make you a great nation. Goes on through Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. I'm going to give you the land of promise. Well, here we see the fulfillment of that. Look in Joshua 21, verses 43 and 45. The scripture says, So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which we had sworn to give their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around, according to all that He had sworn to their fathers. And not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hands. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel, all came to pass. God is a God who keeps His promises. When He says it, you can rest assured of it. What kind of promises has God made for us? Hasn't God promised us that if we put Him first, all else will be taken care of? Jesus said in Matthew 6 verse 33, You seek first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Hasn't it always been the case that as we put God first, He takes care of us? Philippians 4 verse 19, Paul said, My God shall supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. Every good gift comes down from above. God has always taken care of His people. And oh, how I love the words of Psalm 37 and verse 25. David takes a snapshot of life. And he says, I was young and now I'm old. Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, 
nor his seed begging bread. As long as we put God first, God will deliver on his promise. God will deliver on his promise in that ultimate day to save us if we're faithful. Revelation 2 verse 10, the encouragement is, Be faithful unto death with the promise, I'll give you the crown of life. And friend, you can rest assured, if you live faithful to the Lord, you live faithful to His gospel, die faithfully, you will have that ultimate home in heaven, that, that beautiful home that Jesus spoke of. John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus said to His disciples, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In my Father's house were many mansions, were it not so I would have told you. And then he said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We've got that promise of heaven that we must longingly look for and that we must stay faithful to God too so that we can receive that. Now the name Joshua is an interesting name in and of itself. The name means Savior in the Hebrew. The Greek equivalent of Joshua is Jesus. Joshua was a type of Savior. He led God's people over the Canaan, over the Jordan River, into the Canaan, helped them conquer their enemies, allowed them to take the land, and he was seen as a great type of the Messiah. Jesus, our true Savior, leads us over the Jordan of death into that heavenly home. Don't you remember the words of Revelation 14, verse 13? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Death for the child of God. It's not a bad thing. Psalm 116, verse 15 says this, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Well, what then are some living messages that we can take away from the book of Joshua? Number one, we notice that we've got to have courage as we go through this life toward heaven. Look in Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. The Scripture says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, so that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you'll make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. Look at the encouragement. You be brave. You be courageous. You, you stay true to my book, to my word, and then you can enter in to that heavenly home. Friends, Satan is going to do everything possible in this life to discourage us and to make us lose hope. That's his whole game plan. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, He's like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Jesus said to Simon, 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 Satan desires to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Luke 22, verse 31. We've got to be wary and make sure, we've got to make sure that we know Satan is on the prowl and that he will take advantage of us if we allow him. But if we stay true to God, and His Word, if we stay strong in our faith and courageous in our outlook, we can win the battle. In fact, the book of Joshua teaches us that it is faith that will ultimately give us the victory. In Joshua chapter 6, God makes the promise to the people, I'm going to give you the city of Ai. God says, it's yours, I'm going to give it to you. Now, did they receive that gift when exactly when God said, I'm going to give it to you? Or were there things they had to do? Well, there were definitely things they had to do. They had to march around the city for six days. On the seventh day, they had to march seven times, blow the trumpet, and then and only then, when they obeyed God's will, did they receive the victory. Did they conquer that great city? Hebrews 11 comments on this, and it shows us the power of Christian faith. As an example of faith, in Hebrews 11 verse 30, the scripture says, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. Well, how, did they get the city of Jericho as soon as God said, I'm going to give you the city? No. Jericho was a gift to them, but there were still 
things they had to do. They had to walk around the city. They had to stomp. They had to blow the trumpets. They had to do it seven times on the seventh day. Even though it was a gift, there were still conditions to that gift. Friend, this is a perfect illustration of salvation. Is salvation a gift available for all men? God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, Let whosoever will come. Revelation 22 verse 14 following, Jesus tasted death for every man. Hebrews 2 and verse 9. And so as we think about the gift of salvation, it's here, it's available. Anyone who wants it can have it, but there are conditions that must be met. Just as there were conditions in taking the city of Jericho, so today, a person must meet God's conditions. You've got to have knowledge of the Word of God. You've got to know His Word. You've got to study it, and you've got to believe this is the only Word from God. You must be willing to accept Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. No man comes to the Father except by Him, John 14, 6. You've got to realize if I'm going to receive salvation, I've got to change my life. I've got to repent and turn from sin to God. Acts 3 verse 19. A condition God set forth is Jesus speaking, Matthew 10, 32 and 33 said, You won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. And God's condition is a person must be baptized to be saved. Jesus made it so simple. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. Another powerful lesson that we learn from the book of Joshua is seen by the testament of Rahab the harlot. Our God truly is an awesome God. Look at Joshua chapter 2 and I want you to notice what Rahab the harlot here says in chapter 2 verses 8 through 11. The scripture records now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Look at right here's a Gentile, a woman who's not living the most pure life, a harlot, and she gives great testimony to the power of God. We know God's giving you this land. We know God dried up the Red Sea. We know what you did to these kings. Look at the power of our God. You know, Christians often sing that song, Our God is an awesome God, and how true that is. God spoke and the world came into existence. Our God is an awesome God in that He takes care of us every day. Jesus spoke about God's care for man. The, the lilies of the field, the birds of the air, they don't have to worry about their food. And He said, are you not of more value than they? If takes care of those, won't He take care of you? Our God is an awesome God because He sent His Son to die for our sins. Friend, can you imagine sending someone you love to die for the sins of people who weren't living according to your will, who did not respect and reverence you, who had been living in a way contrary to your will. That's what God did. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we, through His poverty, might be made rich. Look at what our God has done. Our God's an awesome God because He's given us the Bible and it is all truth. John 17, 17. It has the power to save. Romans 1, 16. It's able to blast sin out of our life and fill us with the good things that God wants us to have in this life. But then as we think about living messages, from the book of Joshua, we see a message about sin in Joshua chapter 7. There's sin in the camp, and Achan and his family are to blame. Achan and his family, as they go in to destroy the city, Achan and his family, everyone is told not to keep anything, to utterly destroy it, to wipe it out. Well, Achan 
takes a, a Babylonian garment and he takes a bar of gold and he hides it in his tent and under his tent and there and, and as he's doing those things, bad things begin to happen for Israel. They begin to lose battles. Things begin to happen to show that God is not on their side and eventually it comes down to the point they realize there must be sin in the camp and so they begin to separate them out by houses, by families until it comes down to Achan and his family. And he says, confess what you've done. They bring it out. They realize that he's committed that great sin. He confesses that. Achan said, I've sinned. But it was too late. To clear out the sin from the camp, Achan and his whole family were burned. That family lost their life. They perished because of one person's bad choice. But it was necessary to keep the whole camp of Israel pure and faithful to God. Now, what does this teach us today in the Lord's church? If there is sin in the church, it must be dealt with. If someone is living impure, someone is living immorally, someone is not living faithfully to God, that sin must be dealt with so that the church can remain pure. Isn't that what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 4 and 5? Notice these words. The apostle Paul said, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Here we learn a powerful lesson about how to deal with sin in the church. This man who is presented in 1 Corinthians 5, He's living with his father's wife, living with his mother-in-law, many believe. They're having a heinous sexual relationship, and, and it's as though everybody in the church thinks they're bigger and they can just overlook that. They're there in the assembly. Everybody's going on like normal. Nobody's dealing with the sin problem. And Paul says, one little leaven leavens the whole lump. One bad apple ruins the whole bushel. There they see, and they were taught in 1 Corinthians 5, that a little sin would spread like cancer. And so it's true today. When sin is permitted inside God's church, it spreads like wildfire. If people are not living lives of purity, that must be dealt with. Now, are we doing that because we don't love those people? No. Just the opposite. 2 Thessalonians 3 says that we do that because we love them, we exhort them as a brother, and we want them to come back to the Lord. And thus we must withdraw fellowship from those who are not living according to God's teaching. It's God's way. Someone says, well, you know, this fellowship won't work. Friends, it must be God's way. It must work because it's the way God set forth. And if we were true to it, not so much as even to eat with that person. If we really drew lines of fellowship, it would work. If those people loved us and they loved God, they would realize the error of their way and they would come back. And so we must start taking disfellowship, discipline seriously. And elders in the Lord's church need to take the responsibility God has given them and use church discipline to save people's souls. Elders who know, who willingly know, that there are members living in sin who are not living as they ought to, who are not faithful to God like they ought to be, and they don't do something about that, are going to give an account before God on the day of judgment. Hebrews 13, 17 says they're going to give an account for the souls of those whom they watch over. Now, am I saying the very first thing you need to do is run? No, that's not what we're saying. You need to take a step, a process, a process in doing that. We want to encourage them. We want to exhort them. We want to teach them. We want to appeal to them in love. But if that won't work, withdrawal of fellowship is absolutely necessary to save their soul from being lost. And so we learn about that from Achan's example of sin in the camp in Joshua chapter 7. From Joshua chapter 9, we learn the folly of making evil alliances. God had warned His people, don't make alliances with the heathen nations. Don't allow them to marry your sons and daughters. Don't marry their sons and daughters. And in chapter 9, it so happens that they do that. And they are a thorn in their side, in their flesh, from that point on. God said, don't get involved with them. Don't let them rub off on you. And yet they did that, and it caused bad things for the people of Israel. 
Here's a very powerful lesson for us in the church today for Christians. We have got to realize that friendships, if our closest friendships are people of this world who don't follow the teaching of Christ, who don't live according to the gospel, are they going to encourage us or discourage us in our faith? But if they don't hold that same precious faith as we do, they're surely not going to encourage us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 31, the Apostle Paul said, Evil companions corrupt good morals. If I run around with people who are evil and ungodly, and I'm trying to live a moral life, sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm going to bring them up. We hope to God that you do, but you need to think about your own soul's salvation first. They very well may bring you down. Realize that the most important thing you have is your soul. The Bible teaches in Mark chapter 8 verse 36 and 37, what shall a profit a man <clears throat> if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Your soul is not worth a few worldly friends in the here and now. In fact, Solomon gave us, the proverb writer gave us some great advice on the kind of friends we ought to have in Proverbs chapter 12 verse 26. Notice what the text says here. The Bible says, The righteous should choose his friends carefully. Why? For the way of the wicked leads them astray. What's God's advice? Be careful who you befriend. Your friends will either sharpen you as iron sharpens iron, or they'll drag you down as evil people often can do. And so the wicked may cause you to go astray. And then from the book of Joshua, we learn about making the best choice. I want you to look at Joshua 24 verse 15 and I want you to notice what Joshua says. He's speaking to the people, making an appeal for them to do right and notice what Joshua says in Joshua 24 verse 15. Joshua says, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But notice, Joshua says, As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Joshua made the best choice. Joshua said, we're gonna, You're going to have to do what you're going to do. But I tell you what, me and my house, he said, we're going to serve the Lord. Sometimes you have to stand up and you have to have the courage to say, We're going to do the right thing no matter what. And Joshua made that decision. Sometimes Christians have to stand up, not be cowards, not give in to what everybody else is doing, but stand up and do what's right. Maybe you're in a crowd and there are people in that crowd who are not talking like they ought to. Maybe they're using ungodly language. Sometimes Christians have to stand up and say, would you please stop talking like that? Colossians 3 verse 8, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 teaches that we're not to let any filthy communication come out of our mouth. Sometimes you may be around people who are using drugs or alcohol, tobacco, and Christians have to stand up and oppose that. Ephesians 5 18 says, Do not be drunken with wine, wherein is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. You've got to stand up for what you believe in. And that's exactly what Joshua does. Sometimes we've got to stand up for the Lord and His church. There may be occasions when you're around other people and they say, You know, isn't one church just as good as another? It really doesn't matter what church you're a part of as long as you believe in God. We need to remind people, Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus built one church and it's His. It is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said in Acts 20 verse 28, He purchased the church with His own precious blood. Jesus taught in Ephesians, or Paul taught in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, that Jesus is the head of the body, which is the church. And Ephesians 4 verse 4 says there's but one body. If the church is the body and there's only one body, how many churches are there? Well, friends, there's just one. And thus, you've got to make the best choices and stand up for what you believe in. Now, I want you to notice Joshua's final farewell address in Joshua chapter 23. Look at what he says in verse 6. 
Joshua concludes by saying, Therefore be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you to turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. His encouragement, his plea for the people is, Obey God. Listen to His words, study it, and live your life by it. And friends, that's the same plea that we make with you today. You know, we talk about making the best choice. There's no greater choice you could make than to obey Jesus Christ. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9. He is that once for all sacrifice. Hebrews 10 verse 12. Jesus came so that we could have the hope of eternal life. And friend, we ask you, have you made the best choice? Have you given your life over to God to be a living sacrifice, to live faithful to Him each and every day? Well, maybe you're thinking to yourself, what does the Bible teach you I've got to do to become a Christian? Friend, it's very simple. Jesus made it very simple and very plain. You've got to listen to what God says in this book to be saved. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Once you've heard that Word, you then must believe that Jesus is God's Son. I think of the words of John chapter 8, verse 24. Jesus said, unless you believe I'm He, you'll perish in your sins. Do you believe with all your heart Jesus is God's Son, the Savior of the world? Would you believe so much so that you'd change your life? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. It is said of those in Thessalonica that they turn from sin to God to serve the true and living God. There's repentance. They turned away from sin, but that wasn't enough. They then turned to God to serve Him. Would you turn from sin and repent? Would you make that great confession, Romans 10, verse 10, with the heart one believes in the righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation? And would you today be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Peter made it so plain in 1 Peter 3 verse 21. Peter said, Baptism does now also save us. Have you obeyed the gospel? If not, we're pleading with you today to do just that. If as a Christian, maybe you face struggles, maybe you face difficulties in your life, have the courage and the strength to trust God to the end. And the message of Joshua is that God will always lead us over the Jordan to the promised land if we put Him first in our life. May God help each of us to do that as we study the gospel of Christ together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your words. This is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the gospel of Christ.